it's preaching time. But listen, even before we bring the message this morning, there's another message that I want to share. And that is, we know that in just a few days, it is election day. So many of you have, all have shared that you've already voted, you've already made sure uh, that you took care of that civic duty. And so, but I want to encourage those of you who have not voted yet to make sure that on Tuesday, November the 3rd, that you cast your vote. It is too important uh, of an election. Every election is important, but this election is the most important election of our lives. And I am just imploring you, I am pleading with you to make sure that you cast your vote on Tuesday, November the 3rd. Make a plan, decide what time you're gonna go, know where you're going to go, and make a plan to vote. And I encourage you and I uh, thank you for doing your duty so that in the end, we can give God all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. All right, it's preaching time. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Philippians chapter four. The book of Philippians chapter four. We're going to be taking a look at verses six through nine. The book of Philippians chapter four, verses six through nine. And from the NIV, this is how it's recorded. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. As the Lord shall lead this morning, um, this Sunday before Election Day, I want to preach under the topic of peace under pressure. Peace under pressure. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together with our brothers and sisters again that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray, God, for this moment. We pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders. We pray for this election. We pray, God, that your perfect will be done. And God, now we pray for this preaching moment. We ask, God, that you would anoint me afresh and anew, that your word would go forth and not come back void. We claim the victory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Peace under pressure. In the fall of 1988, a song was released and it quickly rose to number one on the billboards. It was entitled, Don't Worry, Be Happy, by Bobby McFerrin. And although the song was simple in its lyrics, it had a profound message. As a matter of fact, the song echoes the same sentiment that we see sprinkled throughout the book of Philippians. McFerrin says, don't worry. But Paul says, be anxious for nothing. McFerrin says, be happy. And Paul says, rejoice. And again, I say, rejoice. But I believe the shortfall of McFerrin's song is that while he tells us what to do, he offers no insight on just how it is that we are to do what he tells us. In other words, he doesn't tell us, give us any instructions on how we are to transition from being worried to being happy. How do you move from despair to delight? How do you jump from a place of pity to having a praise while you are under pressure? Paul, Paul in this chapter, in this fourth chapter of Philippians, does provide some answers to having peace while under pressure. You see, Paul knew something about being under pressure. When Paul writes this letter, he is in jail. He writes this letter, he is in jail, he is in chains, and he is awaiting the outcome of his trial. He doesn't know if he is destined for, for, for jail for the rest of his life or if he is indeed destined to be executed. And not only is Paul under pressure, 
But in this moment, the recipients of his letter are also going through a time of uncertainty and turmoil. You see, the fledging church at Philippi uh, is part of the pagan Roman Empire. It is surrounded by those who are unbelievers and who are hostile to its work and to its mission and who stand as enemies to the cross of Christ. And to top it all off, not only is the climate outside of the church one that is contentious, but the, this Bible, this text, this scripture tells us that there also was a climate of chaos, conflict, and confusion going on inside the church. If you were to go back just a very few verses, go back to verse number two of this same chapter, you will see Paul telling them, telling uh, his, the members of the church that he wanted them to work with Odia and Syntyche, that, that these two people, these two women have been quarreling about something, and apparently whatever they have been quarreling about has spilled over into the whole church. The prevailing atmosphere is stormy and strained and filled with tension, pressure, if you will. And so Paul was looking at a world much like ours with pressure on every side a nation that is a place of uncertainty, knowing that what, that what was happening in the government would have a major impact on the way that they carried out their day-to-day -day lives. Like us, at a place where we did not know what would happen next. Reeling from the effects of a triple pandemic of COVID-19, injustice, and uh, economic devastation, pressure, wondering what the outcome of the election on Tuesday will be, and in fact, what will come after that. Turmoil and turbulence, unrest and uncertainty can put pressure on our lives. And to top it all off, there is even conflict and tension in the church. There is conflict between the white evangelical church and the black church proper. I mean, one, one group has decided that the ends justify the means. One side says, I can and overlook the deeds of a candidate who called for the execution of innocent black boys and is responsible for the caging and separation of immigrant children from their parents. I can overlook all of that as long as he puts the right people on the judge's bench. There are some in the church that are saying, I don't care if he brags about sexually assaulting women on tape and openly supports groups that are racist, telling them to stand back and stand back by just so long as he stands up for religious rights and stands against abortion. Conflict in the church. All the while, there is a whole other group in the church that is yet standing and fighting for justice for all people and who are looking uh, uh, for righteousness to rain down like a flowing stream. There is a whole other group in the church that is fighting for an end to human trafficking and an end to racism and to provide a safe place for those who are seeking asylum and from foreign dictators. There is conflict in the church proper because one group wants to end, wants an end to police uh, misconduct and a new beginning for black lives to matter and the other group is crying out for nothing but law and order. There is conflict going on, conflict in the church like the, like the women in our text and it is more than just a passing disagreement but that conflict. This conflict is causing pressure in our lives. This conflict is impacting us and putting all of us under pressure. But I want you to know today that Paul has a plan. What Paul does that that song doesn't do is that Paul provides a plan. He provides a plan for peace when we are under pressure. Paul gives the antidote to anxiety. He tells us in this text what steps we need to take if we're going to have peace under pressure. And this is what he shares in this letter, and this is what I want to share with you today. If you want to have peace under pressure, Paul tells us in this text that first of all, you must learn 
how to praise. Verse number four says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Paul says that the first thing we have to learn how to do when we are under pressure is we must learn how to shift the atmosphere through praise. And yes, he tells them in the next verse to rejoice because the Lord is near. He is telling them that when we praise, we are acknowledging that God is with us, that God's presence dwells in the atmosphere, that God inhabits the praise of God's people. We are saying when we praise, we are we are offering the, the, the omnipresent God who's already with us. We are offering that God a seat. We are offering an invitation for that God to linger in our midst, to lounge with us, because where praise is, God is. And so if you are under pressure, you've got to praise. Praise. I encourage you to praise him at all times and to let God's praise be continually in your mouth. Because, see, we have to remember that our joy is not at the mercy of our circumstances. Our joy is not at the mercy of what's going on around us. Our joy is not at the mercy of any one person. Our joy is not at the mercy of your current economic situation or your current diagnosis. No, our joy is within us. Our, your joy is is within you. And when you are under pressure, you need to ask God to give you a garment of praise. And as we praise God, we will begin to see our joy increased. And we know then that we know that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So when you're under pressure, when you begin to praise God and God begins to, to, begins to be manifested in the atmosphere, it means that then your joy Joy will increase and when your joy increases your strength increases because the joy of the Lord is your strength and so the first step to having peace under pressure is to learn how to praise God when you feel like it and learn how to praise God even when you don't and so Paul gives us this plan he tells us you can have peace under pressure but you got to learn how to praise God but then this text not only tells us that we need to learn how to praise God, but he says in here you also need to make sure that you stay in prayer. He says there, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Paul tells them to not to be anxious, but to pray, to worry about nothing and to pray about everything. It is a picture of an exchange. Give God your worries and God will give you God's peace. See, this is possible because the word anxious in some translations say to be careful. And instead of saying be anxious for nothing, it says be careful for nothing. And literally what that means is to not to be pulled in different directions by worry to don't be double-minded. In other words, what he's saying here is rehearsing in your mind all the things that could go wrong. That when we are to pray, we shouldn't pray and then think about what happens if our prayer doesn't come true. See, the problem with worry is that worry puts focus on the problem. Worry is described as sitting in a rocking chair. You are constantly in motion, but you are going nowhere. Worry is interest paid on trouble before it comes due. And the fact is, statistics say that 99% of the things that we worry about never come to pass. And the 1% that does come to pass, there was nothing that we could do about it anyway. So I've come to tell you this morning, don't spend your time worrying. Jesus says in Matthew 6, why do you worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink? Or, or why do you worry about your body, what you will wear? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? He says, instead, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of these things will be added to you. The truth is, if there's something that you can do, then you need to do it. You need to pray about it and do it. And if there's nothing you can do, then you need to pray about it and wait. 
But he says, pray about everything. Don't talk about your bills. Pray about your bills. Don't complain about the future. Pray about the future. Don't hold a pity party about it. Pray about it. Don't worry. And so every time you feel yourself, you feel worry coming up in you, you've got to learn how to ask yourself, can I do anything about it? Is it under my control? If the answer is yes, then you need to be about it. You need to do it. And if the answer is no, then you need to do what Paul says, and that is simply to pray. So he tells us that if we're going to have peace under pressure, we're going to have to learn how to, to pray. You're going to have to learn how to praise, and you're going to have to learn how to pray. But this text, this text goes on and tells you the next step. And the next step after you praise and after you pray is that you got to learn how to ponder. <laughs> you got to learn how to ponder. That's right. You got to learn how to ponder. Paul says to think on these things, to think on it, to ponder on it, to meditate on it. Paul says that we have to learn uh, to keep our minds on the right thing. After you have prayed, you need to keep your mind on receiving the answer and not relapse back into worry. I mean, you went for the test. You have asked God for positive results, and then you need to think right about the test. I mean, don't sit around worrying about what you're going to do if the test comes back negative. No, you need to begin to praise God and then take every thought captive into the obedience of Christ. Because the Bible tells us that as a man thinketh, so is he. And so he tells us in this text what we need to think on. He says, think on these things, things that are true, things that are reliable. Uh, is it true? Is it reliable? Is it noble? Is it worthy of respect? He says, is it right? Does it conform to God's standard? Is it pure? Is it wholesome? Is it lovely? What promotes peace? You got to think on the things that promote peace and not the things that promote conflict. He says, think Think on these things. Think on the things that are positive and constructive. And I want you to note that it does not say don't think on something. Because if I told you right now, if I told everybody who's listening to me to think about a giraffe, you could visualize a giraffe. And now if I told you to stop thinking about a giraffe, it would be hard for you to just turn that picture off. But if I told you to think about a giraffe, and then I told you, okay, now stop thinking about a giraffe and start thinking about a hippopotamus, immediately the picture of a hippopotamus comes in your mind. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying, think on these things. He's telling us, don't think on this, but think on this. In other words, replace your negative thoughts with thoughts that are in alignment with the word and the will of God. Don't think on uh, the, the things that, that could happen, that could go wrong, but begin to meditate and think on all of the things that can go right. He's saying you got to learn how to think on this thing. Because have you, ever, have you ever done something and then afterward you ask yourself, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? I mean, or, or have your children ever done something and, and you ask them or your grandchildren, you ask them, what were you thinking? Chances are we were thinking the wrong things because poor thoughts do indeed become poor actions. People who rob banks have usually been thinking about how to rob a bank. People who commit adultery have usually been thinking about how they're going to do that. And so what he's saying here is you got to learn how to replace those thoughts, those negative thoughts, those, those, those bad thoughts, those thoughts of what could go wrong, those worrisome thoughts, those anxious thoughts. you got to learn how to replace those thoughts with these thoughts. Think on these things. And Paul says, and that will lead you to peace. And so he tells us in a very simple, simple equation, I'm calling it, because he says, listen, if you want to have peace, you got to start with praise. You add some prayer, add some prayer to this thing, and then I need you to add some pondering to it. And then he said, and, and lastly, I need you to add some practice. In other words, you got to learn how to take action. 
You got to learn how to take action. After we praise and pray and ponder, we must put it all into practice. Paul says that the things that you have observed, he says, what you've seen me do, what you've observed, he says, imitate those things. Do those things. Because ultimately, after we have prayed and after we have meditated, we got to live this thing out. See, it does you no good to pray about everything and spend times reading and reading the Bible and meditating and thinking on the word of God and then go out living like you don't believe that God will come through. It does us no good to, to learn scripture and then don't, then don't believe the scripture. It does us no good uh, if we are simply uh, uh, talking about it and thinking about it. Uh, yeah, those things are good, but God wants to put some walk with our talk. See, God calls us to not just be hearers of the word, but we are to be doers as well. So Paul says that if you will praise and if you will pray, if you will ponder and you will practice that in the midst of your in the midst of your pressure, that the result of all of this will be that you will have the peace of God and the God of peace. What is God's peace? Uh, if one person defines it as the eternal composure of an absolutely well contented God, the unruffled serenity of an infinitely happy God. See, you will have this kind of peace. In other words, it's the peace that comes only from the God who is our creator. You know that in the beginning it was chaos, but God spoke into creation and everything came into order. That's the God of peace. It is the God of peace. He says the God of peace is what you will have. You will have the peace that surpasses all understanding peace that is beyond our ability to understand and to explain. The kind of peace that keeps you from losing your mind when you lose your job. The kind of peace that keeps you from going off when somebody goes off on you. The kind of peace that keeps you sane in the midst of lost loved ones, in the midst of extreme debt, in the midst of life-threatening illnesses. This is the peace that he says that guards your heart and your mind. And I want you to know when he talks about this guarding, this is a military term. It, it means that this, this, this peace that comes over us is a peace that will guard our mind. I want you to picture your mind being guarded by peace. That means that every time doubt cut, tries to get in, every time that anxiety tries to creep in, your peace guard will keep them out. Every time worry tries to show up, your peace guard steps in and keeps them out. Your peace guard guard will flex its muscle and and keep every worry that you have away when foolishness tries to creep in your peace guard will be on duty keeping your heart and keeping your mind in Christ Jesus I wonder if anybody believe that that God's peace we believe that today that God's peace can keep your mind that God's peace can keep your mind better than Zoloft that God's peace can keep you more keep your mind more than Xanax that God's peace can keep you in the midst of pressure so how do you have peace under pressure? It is simply to don't worry and be happy. And it's not just don't worry and be happy, but it is to praise, it is to pray, it is to ponder, and it is to practice. And it says, and the God will keep you in peace, and the God of peace will be with you. And I don't know if you agree today, but I believe that's good news. You see, God wants you to have peace with others. That's why he started out this chapter telling you to help, to help those, those people that were in the church that they couldn't get along. God wants us to have peace with ourselves. That's why he tells us to don't worry, but to praise, ponder, and to practice. But most of all, God wants us to have peace with God. And to have peace with God, it means that we're living in right relationship with God. It means that we are in right relationship with Jesus Christ. It means that in every situation, if you have the peace of God, it means that in every situation that you are facing in your life, it means you go into it knowing that God, the God of peace, is with you. It means that no matter what kind of pressure we are facing today, that the God of peace is with us. It means that no matter what brand of crazy shows up on your door, what kind of foolishness pops off on your job, that the God of peace is with you. 
that the God of peace was, it is the God of peace that was with Moses when he had found himself between a rock and a hard place with the Egyptians behind him and the deep blue sea in front of him. It was the God of peace that was with Daniel when he found himself in the lion's den. It was the God of peace that was with David uh, when he stood to fight Goliath. It was the God of peace who was with the three Hebrew boys when they were put into the fiery furnace. That's why when they looked in, they didn't see three, but they saw four. Four. They saw a fourth man, and he said he looked like the Son of Man. It is the God of peace that is with us in the midst of trouble. It is the God of peace who is with us in the midst of turbulence. It is the God of peace who is with us with all the things that we are facing in our country, in our communities, and in our lives. And you can have peace in the pressure of this pandemic. The God of peace is who was with Jesus when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was the God of peace that kept him through the trials. It was the God of peace that kept him on that old rugged cross. It was the God of peace that was with Jesus when they gambled for his clothes. It was the God of peace that was with Jesus when they put the crown of thorns on his head. It was the God of peace that was with Jesus as they pierced him in his side. It is the God of peace that kept him throughout that whole ordeal and it was the God of peace that gave him the peace of God that surpasses all understanding it is the peace of God that kept him it is the peace of God that kept Jesus and I want you to know that it is the peace of God that will keep you it is the peace of God that will keep you the God of peace and the peace of God it that is what was with Paul and Silas when they were in midnight in the Philippian jail cell. It was the God of peace and the peace of God that was with Paul as he writes this very letter while he is incarcerated in Rome. And I'm so glad today that it is God's peace in the midst of the pressure that we're going through, in the midst of all we see going on around us, in this 24-hour news cycle, and all of the craziness in this pandemic and the injustice and all of the things that we see, it can cause pressure, but I want you to know that the God of peace and the peace of God, the God of peace and the peace of God is available to you and me today. As we face the pressures of life, the uncertainty of the upcoming election, the variations of trouble that's in our own lives, it is God's peace that will keep us under pressure. And so this morning, I just want to tell you, don't worry, <laughs> be happy. Don't worry, be happy. Continue to praise God. Continue to lift up prayers to God. Continue to ponder, keep your mind on these things, on the things of God. Hallelujah. Continue to stand with God and the peace of God, the peace of God. When you put it all into practice, the peace of God will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, God, our Father, we thank you for the peace of God. We thank you, God, that you are the God of peace who keeps us each and every day. God, when we look around in this world today and when we think about what is to come, we are under pressure. But God, I thank you that through it all, we can make it. Through it all, we can make it with peace because we're going to hold to you. We can make it with peace, oh God, because we're going to continue to lift up your name. We're going to continue to pray about everything. We're not going to worry about anything, and we're going to trust you. The same God who brought us this far is the same God who will take us all the way. And so, God, now I pray, if there's one under the sound of my voice, God, who's just trying to, just trying to hold it all together, God, I pray that today you will remind them that you are the God of peace. If there's one who feels like life is spinning out of control, today remind them that you are the God who is their keeper. God, if there's one today who's ready to throw up their hands, God, today remind them that they can hold to your unchanging hand. And God, I pray if there's one that needs a church home that needs to confess you as their savior, the Lord in this moment, they take this moment and they catch hold of you and the truth of your word. We pray now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we ask it all in that name. Amen, amen, and amen.